hospital. So God, we thank you, we glorify you, we magnify you, even as I move tonight in a spontaneous fashion uh, with some structure. We thank you for what will come out of this teaching today. We pray that we all learn something to help us in our walk with Christ. We love you, we honor and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was struck as I prayed about what to teach today and Colossians came to, to into my spirit. And as I was reading, you know, we can read Colossians 1 through 8, but I'm focusing on Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, which says, if, then, and there's, there's the big question, if. We all question if we were raised with Christ. And um, it is that with that if that strongholds happen. Because our belief system with how we answer that question, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. So, if we believe that we're raised in Christ and we're seeking things below, then what does that mean with that if? The rest of those verses talk about the things that are below, which is all flesh, pretty much. But if then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your mind on things above, not on the earth. And so it's really talking about what, this is my first question when I think about this, because before you can understand if you're raised with Christ, you got to understand how you were raised. So I'm gonna ask a question for open discussion. Were you raised with trauma? Tradition, temptation, or truth? Because all of these things will be a lock to our soul. And I'll explain what the lock is once you answer the question. <laughs> I was raised with a tradition of trauma and temptation. Okay, it, it, it's a trauma. So how has trauma and temptation helped with if you were raised with Christ? How do those things oppose how you were raised with two teddy bears, trauma and temptation, where you're sleeping partners? Yeah. So how does that mindset come against being raised with Christ? You know, that word raised was just highlighted to me while you were saying that mm -hmm. it doesn't come against it. It can't come against it. Well, actually it can. Well, that's yeah, it is with toys. That's what strongholds are. Strongholds yeah. are that we're raising the things we're holding near and dear above Christ. So that's the whole point about me asking this question, what were you raised with? Because what you're raised with mm -hmm. is going to, this was my eye-opening moment for me for breakthrough. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child. But now that I'm grown, I put away those childish ways. And then the scripture says, train up a child in the way that you ought to go. And when they get older, they won't depart from it. Okay, so how was I trained? That was an eye-opening question for me. And it began a path for me to try to find out how I was trained. And I understood that God says, train up in a way, a child in the way they ought to go when they, you know, they won't depart from it. But I wasn't trained in the way of God. But if I was trained as a child so that I wouldn't depart, 
I had to understand that the trauma training that I did have was so that when I grow up, I won't forget my training in trauma. It's not saying that I'm staying in trauma, but it says that it was raised up in me. It was something that had been a part of my very thought process and my very DNA. And I'm not departing from it simply because what am I doing? Teaching a bunch of people about trauma and drama. <laughs> not because I'm in it, but because I was trained in it. What you're raised up in, you are qualified. That's your training ground. That's your teaching ground. It qualifies you to talk to people in the situation that you're in, as opposed to book knowledge and, 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 and going to school and all this theology. I talk to pastors who have all this theology and envy the relationship that I have for Christ. They can't hear from him. They don't feel him. Um, and they, they they're asking me all kinds of questions about how do you do this? How can you send out this word every day? And it, and it touches my heart and I can hear God in it. How, how do you, how do you get that relationship? And this is pastors that there's one particular pastor that goes all over the world, big, big events. And he's asking these questions. How are you raised? Well, Cassie answered, what about the rest of you? Well, I was raised with trauma, uh, the same, and temptation. Okay. And how that work out for you? Not good. Why? Not good. Um, it was destructive to me. Okay. It was destructive to me, but it also caused me to cry out to God. Mm -hmm. like to seek God and to want to know who God was or is all right anyone else want to share yeah I like how you're doing it apostle because we see <laughs> the negative as a negative I was raised without a father so I, I was raised in bitterness but God switched the bitterness to love like I said, every person that I went with, I could take care of their family. I didn't want the child to be without a father. So I tried to material, material things I tried to support. I can do it with love now. But I love how possible that and I'm, I'm sitting up here laughing. Only you can do this <laughs> and, make, and make it make it fun. But we, we don't understand that he allowed us to go through these things so we can touch people's life. I tell everybody, if I wouldn't have been an alcoholic and a drug addict and homeless, I couldn't speak in people. When we speak, they actually feel what we speak to them because of the love that's in us. And that thing that we went through, it shaped us. We got to understand when Paul went through all that stuff, he said, I've been shipwrecked. I've been left for dead. Look what this man did. Because he went through all that. And God told Paul, you will suffer for my name's sake. But all things work for the good. Even when he did Job, when he, he told the devil, test him. And then he gave him double. But I mean, I love how you did that, Paul, because we think of that negative, and, and it is it's hard. But it shapes us and it molds us. Because if you don't go through nothing, you can't tell nobody about nothing. But that's good. I was sitting over there laughing. I said, oh, the only she can just do some crazy or something like that. So what are the T's then? Would you say that not having a father, trauma, tradition, temptation, or truth? Which which one? I get it was trauma. I mean, it, it hurt so much, uh -huh. him not being there. When I met my daddy, I was 13 years old. He gave me a pack of bacon at five dollars. Mm. And he walked out of my life. But when I went back and talked to him when I was 46, and he asked me, I told y'all the story. He said, Can you cook? And God lift the weight off me that was crazy. And me, I, me and this man sit down and we talk. 
I didn't need no answers no more. I needed nothing else from him. It was gone. The hatred. And that was it. And I came back home. It was over off of him saying, can you cook? And it was, but it's, it's a trip though. Yeah, I, it was just bad. Okay. Go ahead, Wendris. I think- um, I, saw, I saw you come off. Uh, well, three of them I come to me. I mean, trauma, um, oh my goodness, trauma, my brain's stuck in my <laughs> um, <laughs> Trauma, temptation, and tradition. Okay. Um, and yet, I, I mean, t I, I see that, but I, as Teresa said, and as you talked about, I can see now, of course, um, just how he is, has been using all of that, you know, and just, um, I was even like just thanking him today and praising him because I said over and over again, as you know, my favorite saying is you can't make this, this stuff up. God, you just can't make this stuff up. And, um, our, this young woman and her mom who are, are good friends now have become good friends and dog sitter for Kaya. <laughs> um, her mom visits from Sweden in the winters and helps to, anyway. Uh, she, when I went to pick up Kaya last week, she was a little teary and she had just found out that her mom has been diagnosed with cancer. Mm. And, and just like God in the midst of it, he began to, and she is one that um, just has faith more in the, the spiritual sense of praying to the universe, that type of thing. But she knows where my faith is. She knows what I believe, but I just began to just like talk to her and just send her information that I've gathered. And she sent it to her mom in Sweden. And now we're all three going to be in touch. But just to see that today, I'm like, God, even in the midst of this, like, I'm just sending her things like, you know, you're going to get this, but here, this is going to be the, the tough part. It's in the waiting, but when the plan comes, I mean, it's just been amazing to me. I can't make this stuff up. That's all I can say is that, so that's a Wendy's really long story, as you all know, but it's <laughs> the trauma, the, I can't even still say it, the temptation. <laughs> you're stuck in trauma. You're traumatized. <laughs> Jesus, I need freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and tradition but I can look back now and say wow you know just um because then in all those times and still obviously I was work in progress but um he he is there and he's used using it all and before um I was allowing it to basically destroy me let's put it that way that's what I'm saying mm -hmm. that's it how about a uh, tradition? We had trauma and temptation, but what, how did tradition, how were you raised in tradition? Um, I think with, uh, well, I can say grandparents on my dad's side, but I wasn't really raised by them. But with my mom and I, because she's, her, her, her faith, their belief is more traditional. Um, and so, uh, I think it was, uh, or maybe the way I took it or interpreted it is that I knew uh, it was more like there, it was by the law, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And there's, um, you know, here's what he says and you need to do this and you need to get right with this and, um, and not, and not really um, embracing or understanding the, uh, his power and authority. And um, sorry guys, um, that's my landline. Um, uh, just this the supernatural oh, part right. of it so yeah. um it just was it, you, can, it, you can get your husband get your husband <laughs> get your husband you're excused <laughs> go on mute answer your phone <laughs> <Funny. laughs> yeah for me um i would say the the two words that came up to me was dysfunction and survival this so, dysfunction and what? Dysfunctional and survival. This, this dysfunction basically is just my family was just dysfunctional. <laughs> so I was dysfunctional. And uh survival. Survival uh meaning we were poor, so it was just you know trying to make ends meet, uh and not some more 
so much focused on uh, nurturing. Um, at least that's my recollection of my my childhood. So dysfunction and survival. So which led to me not really knowing who I was. Um, low self esteem. Blah blah blah. So tradition trauma. Okay. Raised in a in a Baptist background. So yeah. You know, you, you need to do this, you need to do that, not relation dating teach relationship. Okay. Teresa, you it came off mute. You were gonna say something. Um, yeah, this I might I might be off the mark, but while David and everybody was talking, it came to me the scripture where um Jesus endured the suffering for the joy that he saw before him, that joy was knowing that he was gonna be raised and it was gonna be for our benefit. And we may not like the suffering, the trauma, um, or, or, or the temptation or whatever, but in the end result, it's, 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 it's a joy. It's a joy. And it's like a seed that is being planted and it germinates and it has to die in order for it to, for it to live. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. I experienced that last week when I, uh, was going to Tanya and thinking that, you know, she was either dead, gone, or, well, pretty much those two things. And the promise was the joy that I had, that I could ride the rest of the way in peace saying, you didn't have us pull her out of there to kill her here. And that promise gave me peace. So that knowing the end not where you are in the middle, but knowing the end gives you a joy because he's not going to stop what he started. But you have to remember the promise in the time of the problem, in the storm. So that's always the, the balancing act is to know when to hear the promise when the problem is screaming so loud. And so the reason why I pick trauma, tradition, and temptation, and truth is because trauma, you will have emotional stigma. You will have your strongholds will be in the areas of your emotions. If you're raised in tradition, your strongholds will be in the area of your reasoning or your mental faculty. You may have uh, just a lot of questions. You might get stuck because you can't get out the rut of reason. That's where your stronghold is going to be. If your area was in temptation, the enemy is building a stronghold in your mind with your will. So making choices will be very difficult. It'll be almost as if he's whipped you down to the point where you think you don't even have a choice. That's the, the way that those strongholds, just in general, just a, a, a simple way to, to, to let you know how those things grow. And of course, if you were raised in truth, you're going to have the spirit and you run into strong strongholds that are healthy. The other ones will run you into unhealthy strongholds. So that's how come the truth sets us free. Because once we know the truth, we begin to break the hold off of those negative strongholds uh, or unhealthy strongholds, as I as I call them. I'm going to share with you the the, the teaching. Uh, that I had on strongholds that I pulled out from uh, called I Am a Soldier. I don't remember where or when I took this, but um, all right. So we read the, Col the Colossians and we've answered this first question, but it stands in 2 Corinthians 10, three through six, we know this that about we not fighting against the flesh and blood, blah, 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 blah. We're waging war. 
not against the weapons of this world. Instead, we are divine power to demolish strongholds. We tear down arguments and pretensions set up against the knowledge of God. And so the way that we were raised up was for the whole purpose of setting up structures that's going to send you away from God, um, to, to not have you acknowledge God in your thinking or even in your actions. Because like I said, if your stronghold was in the area of temptation and you continue to fail temptation, you're going to have a stronghold in your will. And so you're going to have a hard time in your will making a choice for God because you've been trained, you've been raised up to follow the flesh. You've been raised up to run into strongholds dealing with the flesh, which is all in that scripture in Colossians uh, 3. And so we have to know God. But when you're trained not knowing God, that is even a stronghold because we don't believe because of all the things we've done wrong. How can this holy God want to know me? Which goes to my second question. What's stopping you from knowing God? And that's a real question. Only ourselves. How? Well, we just kind of went over it. Those areas. Okay. Those faulty belief systems. Okay, but you know Christ. So you know the truth. And truth sets you free. How come it's just you're stopped? Well, then either you're going to believe it or not. So it could be doubt. Okay. Not believe in certain areas. Certain areas you do believe them in. And other areas you, it's, it's hard. Because again, the strongholds have been broke. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I missed part of that teaching. <laughs> but I can say for me, it, it, it was uh, shame. Shame, come, help, come, come on. Keep, keep shame, up. well, just shame, the, the shame and guilt for choices I had made. You know what right. I mean? Mm -hmm. So that, that would, that's the times that's kept me from knowing him, you know, or getting, yeah, basically let's just keep it at that or I'll go into a long story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, think about it. Shame says I am wrong. Guilt says I did wrong. And so let's talk about I am wrong. What's stopping you from knowing God? I am wrong. Well, yeah, you are wrong. <laughs> but I still want you. Okay, do it the other way. Guilt is stopping you from God. I'm just picking on this last one because you see how the enemy kind of trips us up. But when I repeat what I'm saying, it doesn't even make sense to what I'm saying to you in your logical mind. I'm guilty. Yep, you are guilty, but I still want you. So the struggle is knowing the facts that you're, you're shameful and you've done wrong. Those are facts. But the truth is God still wants you. So the, the problem with strongholds is we're depending on the facts of our situation instead of the truth of our situation. And the truth of the situation is Christ died for those facts. The facts actually are factual, but the facts can lie because Christ trumped it. We have to stand in the truth, not with our soul, which is our emotional, where our trauma is in our mind. And that could be in our intellect. That can be in our imagination. can be in our reasoning. That's tradition. Or in our will. Those things are in our soul. When you're in a stronghold or when you're in a pressure situation, separate those soulish feelings, those soulish facts, 
for the truth. So you have to find a truth for the facts. If you can find a truth for the facts and then believe that truth, you will break your stronghold. The problem is we don't oftentimes search hard enough for the truth because we get paralyzed by the facts. What are your thoughts about that? Is that for anybody? Of course. You know, that's good. That, that's really, really good because when what came to mind whenever you asked that, the question uh, before this one is, God gave me the word focus. And, you know, I looked it up, the definition. It means the center of interest or activity. And and then Wendy's teaching keeps coming back to mind where we did that, uh, where, where we vowed to keep our focus in, on God. And so, um, you know, and to focus means to direct one's attention or efforts towards it. So, like, keeping our focus on God is is the answer like if we're not fixed on him all these things are going to bother us because we're going to experience trauma more than what we were raised with we're going to experience you know death we're going to experience all sorts of things that we were raised with and and so keeping our focus on god is how we're able to to, to overcome these things. Mm -hmm. And that focus comes with having a truth. You have to have a practical, right. a practical scripture that becomes your truth that you can hang your hat on. My practical truth, many times that pulls me out besides Proverbs three, five, and six that I trust in the Lord mm -hmm. with all, all my heart. But the, the one that keeps me is that you will never leave me or forsake me uh, I, I heard that one today <laughs> yeah. yeah that never he is never 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 means never and right. so when when I'm at a point where the facts say I'm all alone the truth says I'll never leave you or forsake you and that gives me strength Right. When you say a truth, this is what happens when you when you say the truth, it builds you up and gives you strength to run to your strong tower, who is Christ and the righteous run to him and are safe. When you repeat the facts, the same thing happens. That's what this picture is trying to show you. When you repeat the facts, the same thing happens, but instead of running into positive stronghold healthy stronghold we run into the negative stronghold we have to understand the truth and whatever we're believing in our soul is factual find the truth and if the facts become the truth then you either have to repent because you truly did something, you probably should repent anyway. Um, but you can find solace in the presence of God because your belief system is factual and those facts are true. Um, when you have true facts, that means that what you're, what you're dealing with is something that God said that you have violated, but you can repent of it because even when you repent of it, there becomes a truth that trumps it because he's washed away all of our sins. <laughs> and so we can be free of the guilt and free of the shame because God took it for us. Okay? Is that making sense? Yes. 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 Any questions? <laughs> so strongholds this is what you have to know you know i told you guys this before but i'm telling you again because this is what came up today um a stronghold is faulty thinking 
So if you were built on, tra on tradition and reasoning, you were raised with faulty thinking. You were raised in areas that were already setting you behind the eight ball. You were already raised in a, and that's what the enemy does. He tries to condition us from when we're very small to accept lies as being truth. Someone told me, I think it was today, that their expectation was that their parents would love them. I said, well, that's an expectation, but did your parents agree with that? <laughs> with that ass assumption? We just expect things that people don't necessarily agree to because we know there's many people who've had children who never wanted children, don't like children, would rather their children be gone because you've ruined their life. I'm one of those kids. I, all my life, I heard I was a mistake. I make her sick. Uh, you know, over and over again, I was just, she was just disgusted. She would smack me just because I had no idea. She just felt like smacking me and it was just a mistake. All I, <laughs> and if I had an expectation that my parent loved me, but I had the facts and I, I had the facts that by the time, every time she smacked me and told me that I was no good and then had it validated by the world, I had strongholds. I had these strongholds because I had something on the inside of me that God put for love and acceptance. But the only, the only one that would ever fill that void, it wasn't mommy and daddy. Because when mommy and daddy forsakes you, that means that mommy and daddy has a way of forsaking you or else it wouldn't be in the Bible. So when mother and father are forsakes, I will take you up. I had to learn to be taken up by God in the spirit. And when I was taken up by him in the spirit, I had to then deal with my faulty thinking with expectation. But that's what strongholds is. A faulty thinking pattern based on lies and deception. Now, it doesn't seem like it should be a lie that your parents should love you. It doesn't seem like a lie that your husband should love you. But when you're getting screamed at, yelled at, and beat, um, you begin to believe that that's what you're there for. Love is getting screamed at, yelled at, and beat. Um, and so you get this thought pattern that I deserve it. I deserve it because I'm a bad person. And then God kind of tells you something different in your spirit. And when he tells you it, you don't believe it. You think his truth is deceiving and the deceiving is the truth. That's called perversion. Perversion will always make you run into a stronghold. We have to be wary of being twisted, twisted by our traumas, our tradition, and our temptation, because perversion will always twist the truth. It mixes a little bit of lie with, a, it could be a lot of truth, but a little bit of lie misquotes any truth is still a lie. So we have to be mindful. Strongholds are based on twisted thinking, twisted thought patterns, twisted behaviors. What's a twisted behavior that's never spoken? I love you, smack. Okay, so what am I supposed to believe? That you love me or you just cause me pain? Um, is pain part of that love? Oh, I, I'm confused. And that's what comes with strongholds, confusion. And the reason why confusion comes with strongholds is because it begins to build the net around your mind so that you're confused about the voices, you're confused about the facts, you're confused about the truth. See how the enemy works to lay a pattern so that you stay bound? That's why it's a strategy. That's why these are weapons of warfare. 
that's a comment that says you got to take thoughts captive because if, the, if you don't take the thought captive, your thought will captivate you. You will be held captive by your thoughts. If you don't take that thought captive and say truth in your spirit, it starts in your spirit, not in your soul. Because if you try to start a, a truth in your soul, what you're doing is you're running it through a filter that's traumatized, traditionalized, and whatever the third one was, what was the third one? Um, temptation. That's a filter that, you, that you're running truth through. And when it comes out the filter, it's perverse. It's twisted. You have to accept it in your spirit. That's a come without faith. It's impossible to believe God. You've got to take the promises of God, not run it through your soul, but run it to your spirit, man. Because once it's in your spirit, your spirit begins to work with the spirit of truth. And then the sword of the spirit begins to slash and dice those things that are in our soul so that we can come out of our situation, come out of our prisons, come out of our strongholds and begin to, to walk free. If we don't, we act on and the results are we get wounded, which leads to additional strongholds. And the cycle starts all over again. Every thought has a, a reward. The question is, what are you being rewarded? If you're getting more wounds, guys, you're on the wrong loop. Any questions? <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> so why am I laughing, right? I'm laughing because I was talking to somebody today and they don't even know what a stronghold is. See, that's a problem when you're in the church and you've never even heard of a stronghold. It's in the Bible. It's a never ending cycle in the mind. We've got to take our mind captive because our mind is like a bolt. Our mind has our past. Uh, it has our future. Do you know your mind actually has embedded your future? Hmm, how is that apostle? Every prophetic word that was spoken to you, every every dream that you had that hasn't been fulfilled is a future is a future look at who you are and what you're destined to be. It's all locked in your mind. Your past, present, and future, your mind is eternal and it has all of those things in it. Many times we're so busy work walking in our past that we miss our present and we never enter into our future. We have to be future focused. I'm saying that you've got to live by the promises and looking for the promises. Why do we keep looking for the trauma, the tradition and the temptation and defining ourselves from our past? If those things in the past didn't kill you, guess what? They didn't kill you. So that means you're over it. So you have to have something else to look for. And those are the promises of God that's been given to you in visions and dreams. Let me tell you something funny. Amanda had a dream and it was a demonic dream. And uh, she's like, and then I interpreted the dream for her. And she was like, man, I can see why people call you all the time. <laughs> But the, the truth of the matter is God was showing her her future. And she said that she was so afraid in her dream. The dream used to be the devil would come. She would run, call on me, and I'd get her out of her dream. I mean, in her dream realm. Now she's to the point the devil comes, but she's not running anymore. And so now her dream realm is to the point of offering. Once you get past the dream realm of running, the offers start coming. And so the offer was, if you do this, I'll give you what you want. Now in our dream realm, if we take the offer, when we wake up, that offer is good. Doesn't matter if you don't remember it. The devil remembers it because you made a vow, even in your dream room. That's why you got to protect your dream room. And she said, well, how is I supposed to know that? I said, it's in scripture. 
we have to understand our mind is always alert and you have to connect it to the spirit realm, even in your dream realm, because the enemy will come after you stop running and you stand firm, call on Jesus. He's not going to use the same tactic. He's going to step it up a notch and he's going to start making offers. And I told her the offer that the devil made me in my dream realm. Uh, I didn't take the offer, of course. Yes, Cassie. Okay, so I have no idea how many offers I've taken. Oh, my gosh. So is there a prayer? Do we come out of agreement here? <laughs> You're the one that started it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's there's prayers of renunciation. You have to nullify the contracts. You have to know pretty much who's in the contract. Was a generational contract? Um, what power that it was that you were given? Relinquish the power. It really just depends on what what, what deal you made. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just say the blood of Jesus. Amen. Well, no. Well, yes, you can say the blood of Jesus, but you go back over every every agreement that you made one by one and start nullifying it because the blood still works. You have to right. confess your faults, confess it to God, confess what you did. Um, say that you're sorry for what you did um, and, and cover you in the blood of Jesus. You relinquish every um, truce, every seed that was planted because of the, the vow that you took um, and ask for God's power to come in so that you don't operate in those things any longer, that you operate in the power of God and not in the power of darkness. And you just do those things one at a time. If it's a contract, put the blood of Jesus over the contract and remove your name from the contract um, and let Jesus uh, avoid it and then burn it burn it, burn the contract. Um, yeah. So just do that for one thing at a time. And yeah. all of those things will be, will, will be disavowed and then kick the demons out. Of course, it's associated with the contract. Got to kick those jokers out. Right. Okay. Okay. Does that help? Of course. I have a, uh, prayer. I, I just taught it uh, when I talked about escape and it talks about, um, I think it's called later is the prayer pattern and it's a renunciation prayer pattern. I'll send that prayer pattern to you if you still don't have it in your notes, but it's a way it, it's, the, it's the text that I talked about your biases. And then later you use those two things together. Your biases are your beliefs, your um, uh, what's I, uh your partners it's not partners who 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 influences you your actions and your sin those are your biases and then you take it into the to, to the later prayer which will enable you to um identify the lies um i forget i forget the the full acronym but i'll send it to you but then the last step for the r is now you renounce and you begin to walk away from them and so those are two prayer patterns that you can use together to uh, attach, renounce, and, and walk away from and be freed from these uh, demonic uh, allegiances that were made. You have to break those allegiances off, um, break those. That's what the I is for and the bias is, is those influences that you have. You have to break those things off. And so if you still need it, I can send it out to you again. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'll make myself a note. Any any other questions? Y'all want to freestyle? I'm freestyling. <laughs> uh, let me see. Later, you want later and bias prayer because I'll forget. I was going to take all those prayers out of the cycle book and put them all together so that you guys would have them together instead of having them smattered all through the book. Uh, you know, what's crazy is that right now I'm learning about biases within the family structure. Mm. 
and about staying positive and getting rid of negativity and how staying positive creates a balance and it's actually uh, can restore, you know, Mm -hmm. it's about mind, your mind and different attitudes. But this professor wants us to use the Bible with this. Yep. And, and go ahead. Go ahead. And what? No, and just cross-reference the Bible to what the textbook is saying. Well, that's awesome. Well, you have a, a pattern that you can put in your paper that uh, have the folks praying <laughs> to yeah. eliminate uh, to eliminate their natural bias because we all have them. We all have our own biases. Um. Anyway, once we've experienced a wound, a hurt, or disappointment, our heart is fertile ground for the seeds of lie to be planted. Uh, Once I was hurt twice, I said, I'll never be hurt again. That was a word vow that began to create rock, which was a self-protecting girl um, that wouldn't let anyone in. Lo and behold, years later, I found myself in prison and didn't even know it. So we have to be really mindful of of how we respond to wounds and how we self-pacify because our self-pacification brings strongholds, which puts chains on us. And those chains, yeah, people don't get out, but neither do, I mean, in, but you don't get out. So we have to be, we have to want to heal our wounds. A wounded spirit is not pretty on a leader because wounded leaders respond out of the wound and wound people. And that's where church hurt comes from. So you are being raised as leaders. So you have to deal with your wounds. Um, Because if you don't deal with your wounds, you will wound people and God's going to hold you accountable. If you don't believe it, look in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, where he's talking about all the things that he's talking about his shepherds who scattered his flock and what he's going to do to them. You don't want to be such a shepherd that he's going to scatter, that scatter his flock because you're going to have to pay for that. And so deal with your wounds, deal with your hurts, deal with your disappointments, deal with your betrayals, deal with your heart because out of the heart flows the issues of life. It's a wellspring of life. We got to deal with our heart and stop blaming other people. On this foundation, the enemy then begins to build a brick by brick, a wall of lies, um, inaccurate ideas about God. This is the one big one that I'm dealing with with this ministry with you guys is salvation. I have so many people who don't believe they're saved that they're, and they'll give me all these scriptures about, well, what about this? You know, you're going to be thrown in the, in the den of iniquity. Salvation is not the same thing as, as your rewards. I'm just like, well, yeah, you're right. You're right there. Um, You know, what about, he said, you know, you prophesied in my name, but I never knew you. I said, well, just because you prophesied don't mean you saved. The gifts are coming without repentance. He uses the donkey to talk to people. Does that mean the donkey saved? Come on, give me a break. And so fighting that idea about not even understanding our basic salvation and that and holding on to God's promises that nothing's going to snatch you out of my hand. I'm believing that I'm in his hand. I'm not working for my salvation. I'm working for, for, for Christ. I'm, I mean, I'm looking and making sure I'm not caught in a den of iniquity and, you know, backsliding. I'm always thinking about getting caught in situations as a pastor and, and, uh, you know, being called out and people lying on you and, and being in compromised situations. I'm thinking about all that stuff, but at the end of the day, if somebody wants me to minister to them and God tells me to minister and I'm in that house by myself with a man, I'm going to minister to him because God said it. He's got to protect my, my, my human reputation. Um, it's not the best. You're not trained to do that. But I said, God, you know, release your angels, protect me. 
because I don't have anyone here. So here you go. <laughs> Just going to do it. Um, we have to really understand uh, who God is and have right ideas. God is able to protect us. He's able to keep us from falling. And so um, we have to use wisdom, yes. But if God tells you to do something, wisdom's got to go out the door because I, you've got to know his voice. I mean, and sometimes God tells you to do stuff that's crazy. At least he tells me to do stuff that's crazy that I've never heard of before. But then he shows up and I'm like, wow, that, that's pretty amazing. An erroneous interpretation of scripture, uh, the enemy does. Prideful thoughts, distorted perception of how God sees us and feels about us when we sin. That's a big one. When we sin, somehow we think that God throws us away. He doesn't want us anymore. That's why he gave us repentance so that we can change. Not repentance for the purpose of repentance, but true repentance. So here's some more questions for you for discussion to help you get to the root of your strongholds. These are some questions about your strongholds, not your childhood ones, the ones right now. What is a constant battleground in your life? That's what you're gonna ask yourself. What, what unhealthy habit or thought patterns has me stuck? Hmm. And then, what do you constantly struggle with? Those are three areas that you can ask yourself, and I want feedback um, in some roots. You don't have to be detailed, but areas that you are battling, have a constant struggle, habits that you still seem to can't break, and yet you still don't know what the stronghold is for whatever reason. Maybe you've never asked yourself these questions. Maybe that's the first question I should ask. When you have a stronghold, what questions do you ask to try to find the root? Conversely, do you ask yourself questions or do you just roll with the thought? Now I ask you a lot of questions. You can answer any of them. Well, first of all, Apostle, I would like to say that I didn't really understand what a stronghold was until tonight. Mm. I really didn't get the revelation until you spoke of it um, tonight. And then the Lord was showing me how, how that definition related to the strongholds that were in my mind and that are probably still different ones that are in my mind. So that was very insightful. So I thank you for that. Um, what a constant battleground in my, in my life right now. Yeah. Or over time, constant means that you just can't seem to get over it. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm learning about myself on a constant battleground is I am quick to do something without thinking about it. It's like a habit of, it's a habit of, um, I got to do it now. I got to get it now. Does that make sense? Is that a purchasing decision? It could be a purchasing. It could be a doing you know, so it's a, it's a, I learned that that's a ha that's a behavior that is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not good for me. It's it's not very good at all. I don't take time to process and to think. You know, uh, is this necessary? Is it a want? Is it a need? That's for purchasing, or um, is this going to hurt me? Is this going to benefit me? You know, so yeah. So you understand that your stronghold, as you said, was trauma and temptation, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have to understand what the enemy is going to do is get you emotionally connected with that thing. And because your will is in a stronghold, it's bound, you're going to feel like you have no other choice but to buy it. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That's how those two things are working together to keep you uh, bound. So the first thing that happens when you have this emotional connection, you've got to disconnect with the emotion. Because how do you do that? In the emotion, everything sounds good. Right. If you disconnect with the emotion, then you you don't have to make a choice, which is bound to. Well, so let me ask you this you question. Connect with that emotion, it won't take you to that other thing of making the choice. How do you disconnect with the emotion? Wait five minutes. Okay. Just start with that. Wait five minutes. Okay. And in that five minutes, you're praying and asking God, or you're worshiping. You're doing something else for five minutes while you're letting that emotion pass. And in that five minutes, be it worship, be it talking to God, after that five minutes is up, now what is happening? Usually the rush, rush feeling is probably gone and you can now use your, your reasoning to say, man, that really doesn't make sense. I don't even have the money for that. That's going to, or I don't have the time for that, or whatever the thing that you're trying to purchase. Be uh, let me ask. Be Go money. ahead. I said, just be it with time or money. Give yourself that five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. Could be two minutes. You should get it down to where you just taking a second to breathe and, and bring in your your heart rate down so that you can actually think about something. And once you give yourself that thinking space, everything looks different. Now I have a question. You said to go to the root of it. Yep. Right? Right. So I'm thinking what's coming to my mind is childhood and then the, the teaching that you talked about last week on Tuesday was about the poverty mindset and all that with poverty, not just the mindset, but other things that, so I'm wondering, like with purchases, if that is from that root, from the poverty cycle. Well, yeah, you, you, you have to deal with the, the, the root situation, but what we're trying to do first is stop the behavior. Well, in order to stop the behavior, wouldn't you go to the root? Well, yeah, you're, you're working on the root as we're talking. But uh -huh. as the root is being uprooted in your, in your learning, and you're still going to have the temptation to purchase. Okay. And until you get free of that root situation, it could be, and you know, we went through about eight different types of poverty on the day. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to break all eight of those. Well, probably six of them, two of them are positive. You're not going to break all six of those poverty mindsets or poverty things in one setting right okay right and so you need a mechanism to stop the bleeding okay you know if, if you if you get hit stabbed with the knife you're, you're you're going to put your hand over and put pressure on it to stop the bleeding you're not going to just say well i gotta wait to the, get to the hospital because you can bleed out by that time that's so, true what you're doing is putting pressure on the wound to stop the bleeding. Put five minutes or 10 minutes on that thought of emotions. And maybe mm -hmm. in that you're thinking about, am I buying this? Because I feel like, uh, you know, whatever question you're going to ask yourself at that particular point, but you want to just stop the bleeding. Okay. Thank you, Apostle. Yep. Anyone else? these questions all right i'll hurry up all right I'll go ahead, Andres. no i was gonna say that um the constant battleground for me is um looking back at my past holding on to my past whether it be things or people and obsessing about it repeating it you know in my mind over and over again um oh and that spaz child of mine and um so that's the constant, that's the constant battle. Um, now I'm saying this, it's humorous, but it's crazy how God, <laughs> or how I see God works, um, is that I know even in this, um, 
TMI for some of you. Um, but even I know that God like, um, doesn't give someone cancer. Um, that's not who he is because we're healed in him. Um, but he allows it, you know, and he's doing a work in me to draw me closer to him and, and, um, grow in my faith in him and understand more and more of his love for me. Um, but the crazy part about it is, is that, you know, he puts our butts on our backside because we're really not to look behind, right. We're to look forward. And I'm like, you know, just like God, I see it now because the radiation <laughs> is being used on my butt, my behind, and it's burning up. It's burning up. All right. It's on fire. <laughs> And I'm like, God, you flat out burn up my butt behind your child. Cause I know I ain't supposed to be looking back there and holding on to my <laughs> <laughs> And I can't make that up either, God. <laughs> this, <laughs> see, I told you it's all about the butt. Now you get it. Oh, I get it. Trust me. I'm really getting it. I hear you in my head. But <laughs> <laughs> in that though, I will say that I have times where I'll say, God, man, what is my issue? I don't understand. Like, where is this coming from? I mean, really, what is, what is my deal? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm saying my deal and it isn't my, you know, I need to let that go, but I'm just saying my battle here. And I know that in this time, it's still been, it's still been this place where I've thought that other things can satisfy other people can satisfy what only God can, that there's still that battle, that void. And so in this, he's continuing to show me Again, his love is the only thing that satisfies. He is the only one that satisfies. And so I am asking, and I know there's more to it, but I do ask. I just need to take more time listening to him, to be honest. Yeah. I think a lot of times when we were talking about specifically for you in your past, the importance that your grandmother had and when she passed and all that came with that, you know, we also talked about your dad and all that came with that. But if these feelings are still there, then there could be other things that you have not seen. <laughs> seen yet that God is going to show you so that you can deal with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know if you heard if you heard yes, I can hear you and miss I was praying for your cough. Yes, I heard you though. Uh, yeah. And so it's really, it, did you get all the stuff out from your, from, from those past things that we've talked about? And if there's a new, a new thing, a new level, the thing about just talking about that is this, I was talking to somebody today and <clears throat> about their deliverance. And they said, well, since I'm having this problem, does that mean the demon came back seven times stronger? I said, no, you have to believe that the deliverance held, but now that that demon's gone, other things are now being uncovered and other things are being um, coming at you at a higher rate because that one demon was kind of holding back the floodgates from all the other ones, they were hidden. But now that that thing's gone, now these things are in the forefront. So what am I saying? That just because we dealt with grandfather wounds, daddy wounds, grandma wounds, and parent parental wounds, there's other things that may come up in the forefront that we now have to deal with because those things are gone. But now you have to deal with this other thing. It's not that they... That, the deliverance didn't work or the guy didn't show up or he didn't do what he said he was going to do. But now we have some new stuff we have to deal with. Remember, I tell you guys, always after deliverance, after a revelation, after a prophecy received, you have to set a new baseline. That new baseline is to find out who you are. Because when you delivered, you're, you've changed. Because you don't have that veil over your eyes with the demonic. When you get another revelation, you you move something that was blocking you from seeing stuff. So now you have to recalibrate who you are, what you see, how you think. You have to really be mindful of those things because 
He's making us new. How do you think he's making us new? Through the revelation, through the deliverance, through those things to kind of take off and burn off that dross. But you just can't just go through the deliverance or have a revelation, have prophetic words spoken over you and never recalibrate yourself because you're now dealing with an old mindset that's not there anymore. So you have to reshake it up. Okay. So as you think about these questions, also think about recalibrating who you are. Every time I, I, I have a change, how does this change impact my ministry that you've given me? How does this impact my family? How does this impact my mind? How does this impact my emotions? Because all of those things change. And I'm looking at myself and said, oh man, that used to hurt. Don't hurt anymore. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. But if I don't check myself, I won't know what's changed in me because I, 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 I'm becoming new. And I want to know the new Charlene. Um, that's not the same Charlene that was broke, broke, busted, and disgusted 20 years ago. I'm not the same person, you know? So, so anyway, uh, we, we'll skip the one. Discuss the, the uh, strongholds reference up above. So I'm not going to go over this in detail because of time. See, when you let me filibuster, I could talk for hours. Um. But these are clustered demonic strongholds. And so what is this saying? If you have cluster one, which is anger, it's not just coming by itself. It's coming with hatred, rage, murder, temper, cussing, retaliation, violence, abuse, cruelty, unforgiveness, bitterness, being judgmental, taking offense easily, and irritation, irritable. So all of these clusters, when you look at them, that's how they become strongholds because unlike Christians who don't like to walk together in partnership, demons, even though they don't like each other, they don't like you in the kingdom of God more. So they partner for your destruction. You know, if you've ever been in a deliverance section, you might have one demon hiding behind the other. <laughs> I was in a deliverance session one time with Apostle Hopkins and Bishop. And I saw this long conference table and they were pounding on this, this demon. And I saw the demon at the table, just throwing up, throwing up these different spirits that they were talking about. And I said, uh, excuse me, can I say something? Sure. You can say something. You know, I was there to take notes. And I told them what I saw. Oh man. When after that, they went in after that seated demon and he got up. He got up and he was getting mad because he didn't have all these demons he was throwing out to hide himself in. He don't care. Get out of here. I'll give you that right. Anything but me. It's kind of like what we do when we get our back against the wall. Well, Charlene did it. The church did it. The, David did it. You know, my mom, she just, you know, we're throwing out all this stuff because we don't want to get to ourselves. The demonic world is like that. Well, they'll give up something to hide that strong man, that strong man, that's that, that a uh, larger demon that has the power to throw you out um, because they want to stay hidden because they understand this, that strong man, once that rage gets thrown out or whatever it is, gets thrown out. If we haven't dealt with the anger, he can just let the joker back in, you know? And so we have to be mindful of these clusters, demons, and you said, so we were talking about, Teresa, the financial lack, financial stuff, belief in poverty. We believe we need to be poor, greed, dishonesty, idolatry of possession, and failure in life. That comes with that financial lack. And so uh, we have to deal with that whole cluster when you're, when you're talking about deliverance, when you're talking about freedom. All of these clusters. So I give you 13 of them. This isn't all of them, but this is just a good start of 13 different clusters that you can kind of kind of look at. Uh, and they also work together. Like addiction can work with uh, you know abandonment or fear. They they don't they don't stay by themselves. And so these clusters have partners. And and so that's how come sometimes it's so hard to get to the root of stuff because they're all so mangled up that you don't know one way or for another. Um, but I can say if your stronghold is in emotions, you want to deal 
with your emotional demons. So, you know, I would say if you're, if you're, if you're, if you were trained as a child in trauma, for example, I would want to deal with shame before I dealt with financial lack, for example, because that's in your emotional realm. You want to get through that um, emotion of trauma so that you can begin to attack, attack the other realms, which is your will and your mindset once you dealt with your emotional area. So if you're looking for uh, order to do stuff, I would say for the level of trauma or the level of, I think y'all said temptation, I would, um, you know, I would start with trauma unless you're just super traumatized and you just want to be able to make a choice. Um, then I would uh, begin to work with pride. I, I start to deal with your pride because your pride will make you think that it's all about me and I don't have to make a choice because it's all about me. I'm independent and I don't have to think about what you want. So pride, rebellion, those are things that you're going to want to work with. For an example, um, if temptation was your uh, stronghold, does that, am I making sense to you guys? Or is this too much? Let me stop. No, you're making sense. Oh, it sense. <laughs> Y'all wanted me to freestyle. How am I doing? All right. It's good. Great. So, Great. Godly strongholds must be built to demolish the ungodly ones. We've talked about that. There are forces working against us to wear us down and degrade us. So we back down and, and don't fight. That's going to be the worst thing. The best way for me to beat on the basketball court was to take these guys' mind so that they don't even want to shoot. The best way to get somebody not to fight is get them not to pick up their weapon. And that is why the church is depleted because our weapon is our word and people say, it's boring. I fall asleep when I read it. So you're falling asleep when you're reading your, your weapon. When you're sharpening your tool, you're telling me that that's boring. And that's why we're losing. Somebody gave me a Bible today, a common Bible, and it's a cross-reference Bible. And I'm like, I'm so excited about getting into this Bible. He gave it to me thinking that, you know, that I would like it. And I was like, man, but why don't you keep it? He says, I can buy another one. I didn't fight with him. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> the word is like a lie. It's like, I, it's, it's life. The word is life. You, you have to be excited about it. The best way to win a battle is to get the enemy not to pick up his weapons. That's number two. And so the enemy will lie, oppress you, make you ill, distort you, deceive you, confuse you, misinform you, install fear in you to cause you to back down and not engage him with our sword. When you're afraid, I, it's okay. Be afraid for a minute, but step, get out of the fear and begin to step up and say, okay, perfect love cast out fear because fear deals with torment. I'm not going to be torment. I know God loves me perfectly and begin to push that joker back. Um, fear is a natural thing. If we're going through stuff, it's okay to feel fear. It's just, don't be paralyzed by it. You have to come and say, okay, okay. I'm afraid. Okay. Wait, faith, 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 faith. And you start to push in. Every thought, when it says take every thought captive, it doesn't mean some of them. It means all of them. Everything that goes through your brain, you have to take it capture. Every voice, every suggestion, every piece of information, every perception must be taken a hostage. You take it hostage and say, is this God? Wrangle it. Is this God? I want to know if this is truth. If it's not truth, I'm going to throw you out. Don't just receive it and say, oh, well, you know, it's raining out. I guess I'm just going to stay in and be miserable. It's just a depressing day. No, take that thought captive. If we don't know the truth, we will lose the war. Facts lose war so many times. Um, if I would have believed the facts of some things that when I was attacked spiritually, and I believe the facts of what my body was saying, I still believe that I would be sick and injured um, because the facts that my body was not moving and I was paralyzed was not the truth of what God said that he wanted for my life. And so I believed the truth. And then the doctors, of course, said their machines were all messed up. Well, yeah, okay. 
Mental warfare is about demolishing the lies that exist in our mind. Um, mental warfare and psychological warfare are different in this. Mental warfare wants to weaken your mind um, so that he can control how you, you think. Psychological warfare wants to change your behavior. He wants you to do something different. He wants you to influence you so that not only are you thinking different, psychological wants you to behave different. So that's how you know if you're in mental warfare that it's all this reasoning that's happening. Psychological warfare says that it's going to make you do something different that you would not have normally done if you were not under that warfare. And so you have to know if it's mental warfare or psychological warfare, you know that by this, this thing right here where it's telling you, you know, this little bullet, uh, shoot, it's too much bullets. Reasoning, your behavior has to do with psychological. Mental warfare has to influence and change your reasoning, how you perceive things. So that's going to be the main difference between the two. Um, when we think about the Psalms, he, God will defend us. He is our defender. The purpose of a stronghold is to defend ourselves. But the word of God says, truly, my soul waits on upon God. For him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. It doesn't say I shall not be moved. It says I will not be greatly moved. That means that sometimes you're going to get pumped and it's going to, it's going to move you out of your situation, but it's only going to be for a little bit because you're going to come back and you're going to say, God, you're my defense. So you will not be pushed back into oblivion, you know, one step forward, five steps back. No, that's not how it works. Uh, we understand that Christ is our defense. And even though that punch hurts and it's going to knock me off my balance, if you get punched, you're going to get knocked off. It's going to hurt. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to get up. Man, you're going to have to knock me out. Because if you just punch me, that's going to just make me mad. I'm going to be coming back for revenge. So entry points. These are several entry, entry points that you can kind of look at. I can mail this out to you so you can have the scripture, so you can have the truth associated with it. Um, so I'm looking at this last one, next to the last, feeling forgotten or troubled. Um, you have to know that Christ is your refuge. He is your place. When you are in a place of trouble, run to him because he's safe. If you're feeling tempted, that means you have a problem with your will. Know that he's your escape. He's always going to make your way out. He's going to give you a way out. Go back to the, the cycle of escape and particularly the life cycle of escape so that you can understand how to close the door on one season and enter into a new season saying, that's done. You know, that's one thing you can do, Wendy, uh, about your past and say, yes, that's my past. And I'm choosing to exit my past and leave that season behind. My way of escape is going through Christ Jesus. He's, he's my defender. He's my lover of my soul. He's, you know, whatever you need so that you can um, tear down those strongholds. And finally, we've seen these things, um, how to tear, tear down strongholds. You know you have your armor. You know we have the spirit. Stand ready to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, stand clean, cleansed by the blood of God. Stand strong in the anointing and stand in your new creation. But the only way you're going to stand in your creation if you do that caliber check and say, okay, something's changed in me. Okay, what is it? What's, what's going on? Um, and then these are just some scriptures about uh, changing your relationship you have to declare that I'm a child of God. I am chosen by God as part of my inheritance. I know that I am a part of a royal priesthood. Priesthood That's part of my transit, trans, uh, formation. So all of these things, we have plenty of scripture here to kind of soak these things in your mind to deal with the strongholds. You understand from up here in my little shorthand, I'll send this out to you. But this means if your trauma, you're going to have emotional wounds. 
If you are tradition, the strongholds will be in your mind. If it's temptation, it's going to be in your will or making choices. Uh, and then, of course, if it's the truth, it's going to be in the spirit. So that's my spontaneous prepared question <laughs> teaching. Any questions, comments, concerns? <clears throat> no, that was really good. Really helpful. Thank you. Amen. Well, it's all it's, it's kind of off the beaten path of, the, of Acts, but uh, we'll go right back to Acts next week. Go ahead, Teresa. Well, that I learned some some new things, and uh, I appreciate it, Apostle. I really liked it. Amen. I got some insight. Well, I, I know I have to send out the tape for Tuesday. I haven't wrapped that up yet about the poverty because I know that we had a lot of questions on that on Tuesday. A lot of questions. I'll send that out with this one so you'll have both of them when I'm when the tape is wrapped up. I'll send both the tape and my note. Okay. Because I know that was kind of a lot to put on you in, in an hour. All right, no other questions. I see no one else on mute, coming off mute. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for who you are. Uh, we thank you for just letting us understand the strongholds in our mind that we understand that we have to cast down everything that's not the truth. Facts cannot live where truth is. So we thank you, Father, for giving us revelation and insight into strongholds and even our own strongholds as kind of a, a simple recipe for that. I thank you for everything that you're doing and how you are operating in our life. We love you. We honor and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll amen. also wrap in this. Amen. I'll also wrap in this teaching, the teaching I did on the street on the way of escape, because it'll have what Cassie asked for, the prayer pattern for biased and uh, later. So I'll add that to the end of this so that you'll have that, Cassie, with this teaching, okay? Okay, thank you. I have, I have a question, Apostle. Uh-huh. Um, were you going to uh, actually, were you going to compile your prayers? Were you going to do that and send them to us? I'll see if Tevin can do that as my secretary, because that doesn't take uh, my, uh, my, it doesn't take me to do it. Anybody can go through that and rip that stuff out. Okay. Well, Tevin, Tevin got accepted to law school, did I tell you? Wow. Oh, awesome. Hey, you. Yeah. awesome. He passed his law exam. And he got into Baltimore, Baltimore University. For him, that's that awesome. is awesome. Yeah. Establishing the law of God. Yep. Yeah. But uh, maybe I could get him to do that before he starts law school because they say you can't work uh, the first the first years. Uh, you have to just do law. So I don't know how that's going to happen, but. 